Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this main session on human rights, upholding human rights in the digital age, fostering a multi-stakeholder approach for safeguarding human dignity and freedom for all. My name is Peggy Hicks. I'm a director of thematic engagement, special procedures, and right to development at the UN Human Rights Office in Geneva. Um, we've gathered here an amazing panel, so I won't take too long at the start. Um, but maybe just to make a couple of framing comments about why we thought that this was a really important conversation to be having at IGF this year. Um, it starts from the idea that the human rights framework is not just a legal obligation, which it is, but it's also an incredibly useful tool that needs to be brought into conversations at the Internet Governance Forum and everywhere else where the issues around the Internet, digital technology, and artificial intelligence are being discussed. We see this human rights framework for what it is. It's a universal uh, document that's been a uh, set of documents that's been agreed across contexts, across continents, um, and it provides a, an enormous amount of resource and material that can help guide some of the tough issues that I've heard in the many sessions we've all been a part of here in Kyoto. Uh, so we're looking for ways to make sure that that uh, is available to ground some of these conversations. Um, it brings in, of course, the ethical conversations. We, of course, are, are often uh, brought back to the ethics and values language. But we think that the human rights framework is uh, a reflection of our ethics and values and gives us a place that we're able to, to work across uh, all the different uh, stakeholders and contexts in an in effective way. I also wanted to emphasize at the start how much this is a global conversation and how difficult it is sometimes to make sure that that's reflected in, in reality as well as in sentiment. Um, we still see that, that discussions on some of these issues tend to be dominated by certain regions and certain sectors, um, and that we don't have enough of the voices of those who are going to be directly affected and are being directly affected uh, by digital technology in the room. And the human rights framework, I think, helps us to, to make sure that we are listening to the voices of those who are most affected by digital technologies. Uh, Finally, I wanted to mention uh, that the panel also is, is, we've asked our panelists to give us a sense of what their expectations are for the Internet Governance Forum and for the D Global Digital Compact that the, uh, my boss, the Secretary General, has been working on, um, and how to, to really advance those conversations from a human rights perspective. And so we're going to be looking at, for example, concepts like how do we develop a better evidence base for the work that we need to do uh, in the digital sector and on artificial intelligence, for example, and the need for us to have better monitoring and observatories and um, data that will help us look at these issues. And of course, coming back to the framing of this session, the importance of a multi-stakeholder perspective. And the multi-stakeholder perspective, I have to uh, emphasize, is one that provides not just token participation, but actually meaningful engagement from all communities. And one of the things we keep coming back to is that it's not just enough to open the doors. Um, it's also important for the resources to be there to allow that to happen. An example of that, for example, is, is the need for some of the researchers that are going to have access to some of the technologies that we want investigated, um, will they have the, the computing capacity to be able to do that work? Do they have the resources to be able to do what we need them to do as researchers and academics in the system? So those are some of the questions that will frame the conversation we're about to have. As I said, we're, we're very fortunate to have with us an incredible panel today. I'll introduce each of them as, as we go forward. We're going to start with some uh, initial re um, remarks from each of the panelists, and then we'll move quickly, um, I hope, uh, after that into a question and answer with some time at the end, I hope, for, for us to come in with some final comments. So with um, all that in mind, I'm going to turn to our first uh, speaker, who in fact we have two of our speakers are going to be online. And our first speaker is Dr. Cameron Husheng Ashraf, who is the human rights lead at the Wikimedia Foundation and Central European uh, University Department of Public Policy. So we're very fortunate to have Cameron with us, and we'll turn to him online now. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? 
Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Super wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, the conveners and the organizers, uh, the moderators and the rapporteur, and all the panelists here. I wish I could be with you. And of course, uh, the panelists online and everybody who is here or is watching online. Um, my name is Cameron Ashraf, as you just heard. Uh, I lead the human rights team at the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the global nonprofit that supports Wikipedia and other digital projects for free knowledge. We provide the technical infrastructure and support hundreds of thousands of volunteers around the world who contribute to Wikipedia. I'm also an assistant professor of new media and global communications in the Department of Public Policy at Central European University in Vienna, Austria. And the subject of this panel, uh, broadly speaking, was safeguarding human dignity and freedom for all in the digital age. And I'm personally really appreciative of this choice of wording, as I feel that a strong belief in human dignity is why many of us are here at the IGF or why we work in technology. It's a complex, contested, and comparatively under-discussed topic within the tech and human rights field. And I think part of the problem and part of the challenge to understanding dignity online is that we actually have yet to agree on what human dignity is offline. How a person is treated, how they're respected varies wildly by geography. Borders can make a humongous difference, which demonstrates to me at least that conceptions of dignity are in flux and perhaps have always have been. This question of the dignity of the individual and of the individual's place in society with regards to technology, I think is likely to be one of the great salient issues of this decade. We're already asking these questions, you know, when we ponder what, how AI might infringe upon our dignity, what AI might do. And also when we think about where is human dignity in internet censorship and surveillance? What about companies who derive their profits with tr from tracking us without our consent or predictive content based on inferred emotional states? What about the digital divide, people not having access to the internet? How are the elderly treated online? What happens to our collective discourse when it's poisoned by misinformation? The core to me and in, in, with all these questions and a lot more that we could spend all day on is a question of dignity which is something I think few of us can define or even begin to articulate. I think really, you know, human dignity is, a, is something that we just have a sense of, perhaps an intuition, but it's not something that we can actually just look up on Wikipedia uh, and conclude the discussion. And, uh, you know, while Wikipedia won't settle this discussion on human, human dignity, I believe that Wikipedia itself is really premised upon dignity. To me, it's the idea that everyone everywhere has something to contribute. And importantly, that what they contribute is not for sale, it's not to be exploited, and that the individuals who create this knowledge are free to develop their own approaches towards managing the knowledge that they are stewards of. In other words, uh, there is no unelected interference. Yes, Wikipedia is an encyclopedia. Um, it's not a social media platform. It's not an opinion page. Uh, and volunteers collaborate, debate, deliberate, argue, discuss their edits, and curate the world's knowledge. They provide citations and sources. They weigh multiple perspectives so that they can make good faith decisions about content together. They really do embrace the spirit of collaboration across national borders to provide the most accurate information possible for the world. And I really encourage you on a personal note, you know, dive into Wikipedia in any language. Um, it's a really, I think, very humbling experience to see how much people have created not for profit, and because they want to, and because they care. These volunteers set and enforce rules for what does and doesn't belong on the projects, guided by a universal sort of code of conduct, which is supported by the foundation's genuinely firm commitment to human rights standards. And I think across the foundation, all of our staff and our volunteers, a belief in the dignity of the individual to contribute to the world's knowledge freely. Uh, I look forward to this panel and to expanding and discussing this topic today with both the panelists and the audience. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cameron. I think that you've started us off on a really important note, um, really grounding the discussion in those concepts of human dignity and raising the issues uh, that we all know uh, need to be part of the discussion uh, with regards to surveillance, the di digital divide, the impact on vulnerable communities. 
Um, these are all things that we're looking for to be part of conversations here at the IGF and in the policymaking uh, bodies across, across the globe. Um, but I guess one of our challenges is um, how effectively are we bringing that forward? And, and with that question in mind, I'll turn to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Eileen Donahoe, who is the Special Envoy and Coordinator for Digital Freedom at the U.S. State Department, uh, formerly known to those of us in Geneva as the U.S. Ambassador to the Human Rights Council there. Um, really looking forward to hearing your, your thoughts on this, Eileen, please. Thanks so much. Um, it is so great to be back in the IGF community. Um, I feel like there's tremendous energy this year. Like many of you, um, I, I think of myself as one of those strange multi-stakeholder animals. I've been in different sectors working on human rights and technology issues for a long time. Um, I was uh, in civil society actually with Peggy at Human Rights Watch. Um, I also um, was recently at Stanford for the past you know, eight years or so. Uh, where I ran a center called the, Glo the Global Digital Policy Incubator, and we really focused on the implications of tech for democracy and human rights. And as Peggy said, I'm now back in the U.S. government as special envoy for digital freedom. And the way I see my mission, the sort of top-line mission, is to elevate human rights throughout U.S. cyber and digital policy but also to elevate it internationally in all of the technology conversations. Um, I sort of have identified in my very early days three priorities and tremendous overlap with the agenda here at the IGF. Um, the first of which is international AI governance, um, where the goal is as Peggy said, it's to solidify the status of international human rights law as the foundation for governance of AI. And I think of the, that human rights framework as peculiarly well suited to governance of AI because if you think about all of the risks and implications of AI that people are concerned about, starting with privacy, equal protection, non-discrimination, concerns about, you know, ramped up surveillance, freedom of assembly and association, freedom of movement, freedom of expression, implications for the information realm. All of those are human rights considerations. There's also the other side of the equation, which is inclusion in the benefits of AI. And then the other part, I have a little bit of a philosophical streak. I feel like AI is raising these existential questions about the centrality of the human person in the future of society and in the future of governance as the, as the focal point. And for all those reasons, I think the international human rights law framework is very, really speaks to the challenges. I will also note, unlike any other uh, normative frameworks that I'm aware of, it does have the status of international law. It is universally applicable. It's a shared language across, across the globe. And for all of those reasons, I think it is just super, very well suited for international AI governance. Um, the big move I'd like to make there with everybody here um, is it, many of you will recall in 2012, there was the first UN resolution on internet freedom. And it laid down that foundational idea of human rights being applicable online as offline. You know, back in the days where we actually saw these as different realms, and now everything has collapsed together. Um, I think the same move has to be made with respect to international AI governance, because we see this proliferation of risk management frameworks and ethical guidelines, and they sometimes use the same language and mean different things, sometimes they use different language. And my observation is that many of the people involved in crafting these frameworks, super well-intentioned, very well, very knowledgeable, understanding the technology, but underexposed to the international human rights law framework. And so I think that is really the job of this community to um, advocate for this framework and have it be the foundation upon which risk management frameworks can be built. Uh, second big priority is digital inclusion. 
in, in the multi-dimensional sense. Um, it obviously starts with basic connectivity for everyone. And I'm sure this community knows well, there's something like 2.6 billion people on the planet who are still unconnected, and that is a priority. But in meaningful inclusion is multidimensional. It, it, you ha we have to stay focused on inclusion in data, which goes directly to equal protection, non-discrimination. Um, inclusion in content creation, uh, like Wikimedia. <laughs> um, inclusion in the coding community, in the governance community, and especially maybe inclusion in decisions about application of AI. So for all those reasons, um, I, I, I feel like this, this multidimensional concept of digital inclusion, we, we have to remember it isn't only basic connectivity, it's all those things. Last, last point is um, of those 2.6 billion who are unconnected, women and girls make up the majority. And that is a really underappreciated fact. Um, it was really brought home to me on day minus one here uh, with a really amazing event. And um, we talk about the gender divide and we talk about the di digital divide, but they are really ultimately one and the same thing. And we have to elevate that. And I feel like women and girls are also less likely to be included in all those other layers in the data, in the co content creation, in digital literacy programs. So uh, I really think we have to underscore the gender piece. Last is information integrity, which is a really challenging subject um, because we always have to take care not to undermine freedom of expression when we're seeking to stop the erosion of uh, integrity in the information realm. And I don't think anybody has quite figured out how to do that yet, but it has to be prioritized. And I, I think uh, governments around the world, civil society actors, everybody's getting much more engaged on the practical dimensions of how we do that. I will mention we, we just were involved in um, the Canadian Dutch Global Declaration on Information Integrity at UNGA and really pleased to support that initiative. And I think it's got great content, and I think it can really serve as a basis for conversation going forward. Last, I just want to say, it's a really significant moment in the IGF life cycle. And I think everybody here is comparatively more sophisticated about multi-stakeholder governance, but we have to all raise the bar even further. And what does that mean in different la layers of the stack and in different sectors, et cetera? I don't think that's fully flushed out. Um, and I, last point is this, this panel is framed around two things. One is the substance of human rights, human dignity in the digital context. And the other one is the multi-stakeholder processes and how do we advance them. Um, those are not really separate. I think we have to remember process impacts substance. And multi-stakeholder process is how we protect human rights. So I'll stop there. Great, Eileen. All, all sorts of uh, wonderful points there that we need to bring in. I, I really appreciated what you had to say about the multiplicity of frameworks as well and the extent to which the human rights framework can ground those other initiatives. It's not that we have to move away from them, but we need a common framing that pulls them together in a way that makes it so that we're not spread across too many different places. Your point about gender, I have to say I have been here a day and a half and I haven't heard nearly as often as I would like, so I'm very, uh, very impressed that you made that. And uh, the, the points uh, on the way that we move forward on digital inclusion I think are, are crucial and I'm hoping that we'll come back to them in some of our other speakers. Um, but I'll turn now to Professor Peter Kirschlager, uh, Director of the Institute of Social Ethics at the University of Lucerne. We've shared a panel before and we're back here again, Peter, so please uh, give us your thoughts. Well, thank you so much, Peggy. Um, I also wish to thank the organizers for having me on this panel. And you know, being an ethics professor focusing on ethics of AI, I need to pick up a point Peggy was mentioning beforehand, starting to build the bridge between human rights and ethics. Um, because I think, you know, from an ethics of human rights perspective, it is actually crucial to start with a kind of minimum standard, B 
being human rights, allowing people to survive and allowing people to live a life with human dignity, being very much informative, I think, for basically the entire value chain um, of, of AI. And uh, you know, interestingly enough, we can also observe a certain kind of converging ideas when we look at the different process, I mean, look at the results of the IGF so far, look at the you know, high-level advisory board on multilateralism, like if more effective multilateralism. Um, but I want to also recognize, you know, the consultations in the framework of Global Digital Compact, but also, um, you know, policy briefs by the Secretary General, but also statements by the Secretary General in the UN Security Council this summer, but also the, the la latest resolution in the UN Human Rights Council, and also statements by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Converging ideas in the sense that first, it is clear that we need a regulatory framework, and secondly, it is also clear that this regulatory framework needs to be human rights based. And thirdly, um, there's also a converging idea that we need at the UN institution, some body, some entity taking care of the enforcement, the implementation of this regulatory framework. And I think this, this convert, this uh, reality that we have these converging ideas um, you know, coming together on these focal points, I think is something which we need also kind of to celebrate that we achieved already now in the discourse about um, so-called AI, this, this consensus in these three, uh, with these three characteristics. And I would like to add that, you know, from an ethics of human rights perspective, using a human rights-based approach for the regulatory framework is also good news for technology. Um, because it's not overburden technology with some higher ethos. Um, I mean, human rights is really a minimum standard from an ethical point of view. And, and secondly, human rights are also able to not only protect, but also foster and promote diversity. And by that, also able to promote and foster innovation by allowing people to think out of the box, by allowing people to freely express their opinion, by allowing people to have access to all the information which is there, which of course is crucial for being innovative. And secondly, regarding you know, the, the agency, the, that there is a need for a UN body taking care of this existential issue of AI, AI and how we use AI on the global level, including you know, the huge positive potential AI can have for us as humanity and for the planet, but also including looking more precisely also on the ethical risks it poses. Um, this, this agency could have, and that's uh, you know, based on my research, a multi-year um, research project I started at Yale University and finalized at the University of Lucerne, um, one proposal could be to follow the model of the International Atomic Energy Agency because I would argue, and that's as a proposal, as a suggestion for further thoughts, um, that you know, both nuclear technologies and AI share a dual nature. Both of them having you know, an ethical positive potential, but also an ethically negative potential. And in the field of nuclear technology, I'm simplifying now very much, we basically did research first, then we created the atomic bomb, Unfortunately, we used the bomb several times, and then we realized as humanity that we need to do something about it. And we created the International Atomic Energy Agency at the UN, basically taking care of the fact that we can avoid the worse. And even as an ethicist, I'm not that naive, not acknowledging that, of course, that's not perfect, it has its geopolitical implications, but still we need to acknowledge that the International Atomic Energy Agency was able to avoid the worse. And I would think, you know, in similar terms, I would follow, actually, I would suggest to follow the model of the International Atomic Energy Agency also in the field of AI, creating an International Database Systems Agency, IDA, at the UN, first for focusing on finding out, identifying, you know, the ethically positive opportunities which AI is offering to us. Secondly, also identifying, of course, you know, the, the ethical risks, 
but also, thirdly, in enhancing international cooperation, collaboration, technical exchange, technological exchange, what we also see, you know, how fruitful that can be also here at the IGF. And of course, also being, you know, benefiting from all the different initiatives in this field, um, bringing them together, um, combining also multi-stakeholder approach with a multilateral approach, um, because both of them have their advantages and disadvantages now from an ethical point of view. So bringing that together in, in making sure that at the end of the day, all humans can benefit from AI and also the, the planet can benefit from AI. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Peter. I, I, I think uh, you did something that's not that easy, which is that you gave us an optimistic perspective on, on where we are, uh, that we're, we have consensus around the needs in a way, in the broad sense, the pathway is there, but how we get there is, is the critical question. And I think your, your comments, as well as Eileen's on information integrity, point to the fact that we need to now take that conversation to the next level. We've identified these complex issues. We've recognized there's no silver bullet, there's no switch that we can flip that's gonna solve these issues, but we need to, to really look deeper at the different needs. And for example, on the, on the broader AI question, I think the compelling idea that we can't expect any one institution to actually necessarily accomplish everything. But the idea, as you put forward, of an observatory or, or really having an authoritative body that can at least give us some of the evidence base and the monitoring that we need is a, is a step in that direction. Um, I'd like to now turn to uh, Mallory Nodal, the Chief Technology Officer at the Center for Democracy and Technology, a, a key partner of ours on these issues and with enormous expertise. So we're really looking forward to hearing Mallory's thoughts. Please. Thanks. Thanks very much to the organizers and, um, and for inviting me to talk about this. In fact, I do want to touch on sort of some of the work that we've done with the OHCHR at some point. Um, I, my, question, my, my response to this is a little bit broader than just what the IGF community does. I think of the whole constellation. I'm actually looking at the ceiling. There's a whole constellation of fora out there that govern the internet, that do different things. We're now including AI, not just the internet anymore. And they all are meant to sort of come together here at the IGF where we present, we share, we cross for analyze all these different issues. And so when I think about these issues, I, I think about that, that broader landscape, although they all, end up, they all end up landing here, don't they? Um, I wanna reaffirm what others have already said, which is that um, this isn't a panel about ethics. This is about human rights. It's the most tangible, useful mechanism we have to talk about the most pressing social issues of our day. Um, one of my for former colleagues, Vidushi Marta, always said, hey, um, human rights is governance with teeth. Um, and she talked about that in her paper on, on AI, but I think it applies um, across the board when we're talking about governing. Um, technology. And, and so because this is a really complicated landscape that's only getting more complicated, I think it can be useful to just take a moment to um, appreciate that and also to analyze what everyone is currently doing and what their relationships are to human rights and what their roles and responsibilities are. So we know, right, that states have the obligation. Um, we know that companies have a responsibility to human rights. I wonder, though, sometimes how we conceive of all the other stakeholders. For, for me, having worked in this field for my entire career now um, as a civil society representative, it is really the vision and the mission of civil society, in essence, why, why we're here. Um, but then we have um, academia, I think, plays a really important role. But where I work most um, consistently is in the technical community. And I don't know that we've firmly established what is the technical community's relationship to the human rights framework. I think we're working on that now, and the OHCHR report that is soon to come out um, touches maybe on ways of mechanizing human rights discussions within the technical community, um, supporting those discussions. But we haven't yet had the philosophical conversation what is the technical community for or to the human rights framework. Now, to reflect it for a moment, the technical community admittedly is made up of other stakeholders. It's really industry and states, 
you have increasingly civil society members there, but not, not that many. Um, and so then there, there's a question of, okay, if you have states that are obliged to the human rights framework, if you have um, um, companies that are responsible for it, why isn't the technical community already talking about human rights? Why isn't it already baked in? Um, and I think that it's comfortable maybe to talk more about the technology than it is to talk about the hard problems or to talk about the hard problems in technocratic terms is a comfort zone. Um, it's also um, the language of products and of producing and of Right, and so there's um, just a different way of talking about it. I, when I very first started engaging in the technical community, I found myself always having to say human rights things, but in a totally different way. I had to create these value trade-offs. So there was one design possibility over here, but then there's another design possibility over here. Let's just list out the requirements and talk about the trade-offs, rather than saying this one's better because it's better for freedom of expression, because that wouldn't have gone anywhere. That wouldn't have helped. I think we've made progress, right? I think that now that there are more and more human rights advocates in um, the technical community, it's becoming easier to talk about this is the end goal because human rights would be better under this design, but it still very much has to be um, sort of reconstituted into its constituent parts and then put back together. And that's really important work that we need to keep doing and we need to do more of, not because we should turn technical discussions into political theater, uh, but because, again, what my colleagues have been saying, these are actually the hard problems. When you characterize the hard problems of technology in their roots, in their real essence of being about people, you'll actually get to the answer quicker and better. And that's all we're really trying to do. And while that can be challenging for people that um, have only been formally trained in the sciences, it isn't impossible. It wasn't impossible for physics and chemistry. It's not impossible for um, computer science engineers either. Um, I, I think I should probably be ending soon um, with my time, but I wanted to just really quickly say that substantively, I think one issue that I've seen travels throughout all the fora across all the stars in the internet governance constellation is censorship and um, internet resilience. And I see that as a real, um, one of our first starting points when we bring together a real end user or people-centric issue that all fora can engage on and every, every um, technical community's conversation, every standard has a role to play in figuring out how we ensure the internet stays on, that there's meaningful access everywhere. And so I'd invite folks to really consider that as um, a centerpiece uh, for cross fora engagement on internet issues and human rights. Um, so I would just hope that this conversation continues to talk about human rights, not just at the IGF, but in all fora, and the IGF in perpetuity. It's not that human rights is coming in or out of fashion. It's, it's a constant vessel for all the things that should matter to us, and we need to make sure that no matter what fora it is, no matter where that forum is hosted, or what venue we're in that we're able to bring these issues up and to tease out the, um, the really important things for, for um, people everywhere. That's it, thanks. Great, thanks so much, Mallory. I, I think you made uh, some, some fabulous points there. Um, and, and really this emphasis on the bridges to the communities that have to be part of the conversation. And what I liked about what you said is, is the, give us that idea that people out there are having human rights conversations all the time, they're just not aware or framing it as a human rights conversation, but those trade-offs and those discussions around the impacts of technology in different ways, those are conversations that the technology uh, experts that I've engaged with really want to have. Um, and I do think making that bridge to, to help with the framework that can underlie those conversations more uh, substantively will be really helpful. And your points about censorship and, and where we need to go on issues around internet shutdowns and, and uh, the need for a, a approach that puts people at the center are, are crucial. Um, we're going to turn now to our, our second online participant. We're very fortunate to have with us Dr. Marielza uh, Oliveira, the director of UNESCO's Communications and Information Section Division for Digital Inclusion, Policies and Transformation. UNESCO's as good at long titles as my office is. Um, over <laughs> to you, Marielza. Uh, well, hello, Peggy. Thank you, and hello, everyone. 
it's a great uh, pleasure to be here with you. And I, I'm sorry I cannot be in Kyoto in person. Uh, we've attended all IGF since the very beginning, and but this year we have a, a, a smaller team online, you know, in presence. Um, well, UNESCO is, a, is kind of the, at the front uh, line uh, of uh, seeing the opportunities, but also the barriers uh, that uh, um, the digital spaces can create because our mandate is exactly the free flow of ideas by world and image. Um, and um, so for us, we've centered our work on fostering the kind of ethical and human rights based uh, framework that can enable digitalization to uh, bring forward uh, human rights and human dignity, because it's actually not advancing um, at a fast, you know, while it's advancing at a fast pace, it's not really benefiting everyone equally and actually quite harming, you know, creating quite a lot of harms. Um, our digital era is kind of a troubled one and we really need to reboot our digital spaces, particularly regrounding it on trust and facts. So, um, you know, regaining ground on a, a goal, a vigorous and healthy public debate requires that we really protect information as a public good, defend freedom of expression and access to information everywhere but because of its scale and reach, particularly online. Individuals and societies need to relearn the value of facts and knowledge, and we need to support a fact-based, evidence-based generating bodies such as you know, academia, science institutions, as well as public interest independent media. And uh, the IGF uh, as a multi-stakeholder mechanism actually bring quite a lot to this, uh, to this conversation. Um, but, but we, play a leading role in facilitating the international cooperation and shaping a human rights-based digital future um, because we actually work on strengthening human rights-based standards and regulatory frameworks under which digital ecosystems evolve. Um, last year, for example, we held the Internet for Trust uh, uh, conference exactly to look at regulation of internet platforms. And at the end of this month, we're actually say, uh, launching our guidelines uh, that uh, center uh, um, this type of regulation, uh, particularly on uh, accountability and responsibility, which is missing in uh, digital ecosystems. And regulation and standards uh, are how we ensure oversight, protect the public good, and encourage also investments that because they actually create level and stable playing fields for innovation to flourish. Um, we see that all countries that are at the forefront of digital transformation are actually engaging in the development and implementation of regulation of digital spaces and technologies, uh, particularly social media and artificial intelligence, because they really see the need for that. But uh, these efforts really need to be complemented by global standards and guidelines that facilitate collaboration between actors in government, private sector, civil society, this mode stakeholder approach. Um, and uh, so we are being setting standards in the area of digital transformation, our recommendation and guidance, uh, for example, in transparency of digital platforms, open science and open data, ethics of artificial intelligence, ICT competences for teachers and others, they are instruments that uh, foster innovation while protecting human rights and promoting accountability. That's how we, we center our work. And a second line of action that we, we, we always bring is to strengthen institutions and systems that can enable cooperation on digitalization issues. It's really important that we develop human and institutional capacities to harness the potentials and address the challenges of digital technologies and platforms. Um, and we prior prioritize the capacities of these groups whose decisions and actions have kind of the widest and the deepest impact. For example, policymakers and civil servants, particularly judicial operators, since they have a special role in shaping the environment with, in which our digital ecosystems are developed as well as educators but is the, who are responsible um, to impart knowledge in line with 21st century requirements and young people, need digital navies that lead this process uh, globally. And we value very much the networking and collaboration, knowledge sharing among stakeholders and foster uh, ideas for engaging uh, on best practices and, and uh, 
on regulation and, uh, uh, and the conversation around uh, human rights. But we must also you know, raise the skills and competences of users of digital technologies and platform. Um, media and information literacy being essential to build critical thinking, uh, technical and other skills, knowledge and attitudes that allow us you know, to derive value from digital information ecosystems and avoid the traps they set by uh, misinformation, conspiracy theories, disinformation, hate speech, online incitement to violence and others. And the stakes are really high, you know, so we, we really need to bring this conversation um, uh, in, a, in a bigger way around the, uh, the IGF and other um, digital ecosystems, particularly in this year uh, that, uh, that we have uh, so many uh, governance changes, for example, you know, with the WISIS plus 20 process uh, uh, taking the uh, shape, um, starting uh, the Global Digital Compact coming up and, uh, and other, you know, mechanisms such as the AI um, um, body that is being thought out and so on. So um, this is the occasion in which we have the chance to do this big reboot. Thank you. Thanks very much. Very helpful perspective there and, and really sort of linking back to where Cameron started us on the importance of information um, and data, two, two points that are crucial to the conversations. But I also liked as well the points that Marielza makes around uh, human capacity, the institutions and structures, um, and the need for us to build up the ability to tackle these issues in a human rights uh, compliant way as well and, and how we get there. And I'm sure our other panelists may have some thoughts on that front. Um, there are still two more panelists to go. I appreciate everybody's patience before we get to the questions and answers. Um, but I'm going to turn now to Frederick Rowski, who's the head of human rights policy for Asia Pacific at Meta. Um, and my notes say, Frederick, you're also a composer of electronic music. So I don't, I don't know if you'll bring that in, but um, over to you. Thank you. How did that fact get in there? I didn't offer that bit of my biography, but um, happy to discuss that offline. Um, look, it's hard to be sixth or seventh in line in a conversation. It has benefits and downsides. So, uh, it, on the positive side, I have a better sense of where the conversation is going, but I've also, I also have so many notes now to my remarks that I'm not sure that they're valuable to me anymore. But I'd just like to say, uh, I'd like to thank the IGF and to OHCHR and everyone else for giving us the opportunity. And apologies for my voice, I've lost my voice. Um, and just to say that I'm personally excited about being, being part of this panel. I joined the human rights policy team at Meta um, last year in July after uh, several decades of work in the international civil society space and with the UN, including with the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, and am committed in my current role as the head of human rights policy for the Asia Pacific region, and that's part of a larger um, team, human rights policy team globally, to um, engaging in all of our work in a multi-stakeholder and consultative manner. Um, but with that background, I, I came to this space with, um, with the perspective of a critical outsider and had a fair amount of skepticism coming in about how successful we could be in building a human rights framing and human rights approach um, to, uh, to the business. But I, I have to say that I've come to appreciate how successful Meta has been in, in doing this. There, there's a long way to go, but, um, uh, but I think a lot of progress has been made, particularly since we adopted our corporate human rights policy in March of 2021. Um, we try to show this commitment rather than just talk about it, but just a few, a few things that we have uh, pushed forward with in the last couple of years are building a human rights team itself, it's relatively new, adopting the human rights policy, launching the oversight board, which has adopted human rights as a principal basis for its work, creating a human rights defenders fund, committing to protecting expression and privacy against overbroad government demands, a commitment that we made when we joined the Global Network Initiative in 2013, which I think is another um, uh, institution worth talking about. Um, we've published two annual human rights reports. This is the most recent one, um, and what makes this one interesting is it includes a summary of our enterprise-wide salient risk assessment, which is something that we committed to do and are now beginning to publish some of the outcomes of that, and it looks across human rights risks throughout um, throughout the company, up and down the value chain. 
And we continue to publish other forms of due diligence at the country level. We've done one recently on Israel-Palestine, on end-to-end -end encryption, and a number of other issues. And over the last two to three years, um, we've strengthened our engagement with UN actors and agencies. This is included um, with the UN Global Compact, our commitments to the UNGPs, engagement with the Secretary General's office, OHCHR, UNICEF, UNHCR, off of the Office of the Special Representative for the Prevention of Genocide, many special rapporteurs and country teams. And we have a 20-person, I think, delegation here to IGF, which I'm very proud of, including our president of, um, of global policy, um, just to represent the commitment that, that the company has to, to this kind of engagement. Um, I can already hear the groans from some of my civil society colleagues in the audience. Um, you know, okay, yeah, they're, they're listing off all of the great things they've done again. Um, so I, I do want to acknowledge up front that this is not easy. There are many challenges to integrating human rights standards into company policies um, and making them more than a fig leaf, but actually influential on important decisions, even decisive. Uh, I work in the Pacific region, in Asia Pacific region, uh, which has an extraordinary amount of linguistic and cultural diversity, a fractured regulatory space, vibrant and growing economies, and where governments have, let's say, an inconsistent commitment to democracy and human rights. And as I list those off, I realize that I'm talking about the world and not about uh, the Asia Pacific. So it does sometimes feel difficult, if not impossible, to live up to the, the dual commitments that the company makes to both comply with local law in these many different jurisdictions and to abide and promote international human rights standards at the same time. That's all to say that we seek expert guidance and we give it where we can. Uh, we want consistent and principle-based frameworks that we can't and shouldn't be developing ourselves. And for these reasons, we, we strongly support the leadership of the UN in facilitating the global process and improving global cooperation through the GDC and, and the IGF and, and other fora. I'll, I'll end by just mentioning that we recently made a submission of inputs to the GDC and highlighted a number of actions, and I, uh, some of which include um, actions that we would take collectively in a in, in consultative manner, urging governments to resist policies that enable the misuse of personal data or impose overbroad restrictions on protected speech, supporting the use of end-to-end -end encryption against overreaching surveillance and encroachments on freedom of expression, offering support to capacity building initiatives, inclusive ones, for public and private sector actors to prevent and react to harmful, malicious, and hostile behavior online. And this is where my notes get kind of, I'm so confused that I can't follow them anymore. But I would just, on that last point around multi-stakeholder engagement, a couple of thoughts came to mind as I was listening to others speak. One is, um, in my role in, in Meta and coming from a civil society and international organization perspective, I do see that there is still a significant gap um, in understanding across stakeholders. There is, as has been mentioned, conversations are happening all the time about human rights, but they're not being conducted in human rights terms and human rights language. And there's still a long way to go to kind of socialize and um, communicate that human rights framework. Um, the, um, the other challenge there in that gap, I think, is now that I'm living among engineers and, and uh, software designers and salespeople and, and all of that, is to translate those principles into, into action. Um, there are many examples. Uh, robot plan of action, you know, how do you, how do you take that and turn it into language that can be implemented as policy? How do you then take that language and turn it into something that can be applied at scale? It can be coded, can be understood by engineers, can be understood by people who are promoting um, the business and other aspects of the business policy. And the second thing that came to mind is this risk, the concept of risk. I'm constantly talking about risk with people and everybody understands this. There's legal risk, there's business risk, there's policy risk, um, and there's human rights risk. And I think we're often talking about similar things, but we give them different valence. They have, um, they play a different role in the balance of decision making among different parts of companies and different parts of governments. And I think there's I think there's some progress that can be made there in, in both developing a shared vision about we, what we mean by human rights risks and impacts, and especially how they interrelate with these other frameworks for assessing and understanding and mitigating uh, risks that are, that are much more common and frankly more widely understood amongst uh, many people in the technical and business community. So I'll leave it at that, uh, and thanks again so much for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak.
Thanks, Frederick. We really appreciate uh, the company perspective and, and your willingness to come and, and be part of a forum like this and, um, and discuss you know, how, uh, what Meta is doing and, and what areas there, there are still room for improvement in. Um, I think your point about the risk assessment uh, frameworks is a really interesting one that comes up quite a bit for us as well. Um, and is an area where we might be able to bring things together a, a bit better, um, taking Mallory's point about putting people at the center of it and the human rights analysis that will help us to do that. Um, but fortunately, we have with us one final panelist who uh, has been patient, um, and we're very much looking forward to his insights. Uh, Benga Sassan is the executive director of the Paradigm Initiative and a member of the IGF leadership panel. Um, over to you, Benga. Thank you, uh, Peggy. Um, we're talking about human rights and multi-stakeholder processes, and I think it's, it's a good time um, to you know, state clearly that we can't have multi-stakeholder conversations if certain stakeholders can't be on the table. It's hypocrisy at best uh, to say that we're having human rights conversations and it's multi-stakeholder, and there are stakeholders that can't be on the table, um, where the IGF 2023, and I keep hearing stories of people who wanted to be here but couldn't make it because of visas, and it's not just this IGF, it's the IGFs before now and many global processes. There are barriers to entry, and I think we have to address this. You have no idea how dehumanizing it is for you to stand in front of a visa officer to defend your existence and expertise. It is, it shouldn't even be a thing because you're going to contribute to conversations and you're not uh, you know, trying to do something else. So I think it's important you know, for us to, to set that uh, as, as a conversation to continue and that if you're hosting the IGF or you're hosting a global, if you call it global, then it has to be global. And if it's global, it means you have to open your doors to relevant stakeholders. And I, I know this is part of a bigger uh, you know, migration debate, but we can't pretend that this, this is not happening, uh, and, and we're talking about human rights. Uh, anyway, and, and speaking of which, uh, when we talk about global, you know, processes, including the GDC conversation, including the IGF, and all of the conversations we will have, uh, one, of, one of the important opportunities we also have is that we have data and we have stories on human rights, either human rights violations or human rights defense uh, from civil society organizations that have been working on these issues for a very long time. Uh, and I think it's very important for us to take advantage positively of this information, this data, and be able to improve processes. And because when we have these conversations, one of the things we must realize is that there are people with lived experiences that we can't ignore. And these lived experiences will help us understand what the issues are. We don't need to commission a study, for example, to understand some of the violations that happen in some of the countries across the world uh, and how to respond you know, to, those, to those challenges. Um, some, of, some of you may be aware that the leadership panel, the IGF leadership panel you know, presented a paper a few days ago. Uh, well, not a few days ago. It feels like it's a long week already. Uh, I think just two days ago, actually, uh, presented the Internet We Want paper. And, and the whole idea of that paper is to you know, ask the question, what Internet do we have right now? What Internet do we have? What Internet do we want? Uh, and what is the gap, and how do we do that? And of course, there are the five uh, you know, overarching areas, it should be all and open, it should be universal and inclusive, it should be free-flowing and trustworthy, it should be safe and secure. Uh, but I want to emphasize the fifth point, which is that it must also be rights-respecting. Uh, and, and by saying that it should be rights-respecting, I want to just focus on just one tiny area of that. Uh, we talk a lot about the 2.6 billion people who are not connected, and I want them to be connected. Uh, I say to people that my life story, my career journey, was made possible because of one email, uh, and that is the power of the internet. Uh, so there are 2.6 billion people who are not connected, but don't forget, there are also people who are disconnected. And I want to emphasize that, because we're talking about human rights, there are people whose governments, or whose certain activities or situations have rendered them disconnected. And because they are disconnected, we count them as part of the connected, because we're focusing on the unconnected. 
which is a 2.6 billion. And I think it's really important. Uh, I'm glad that the Freedom Online Coalition released a statement this week on, you know, on internet shutdowns. It is not a conversation that we should be having in 2023. But again, it, it is uh, what it is, the world as, as it is, and where we need to go. And I think finally, is to say that you know, uh, global policy processes are not for aliens. Uh, they're for humans, and so at the, at the center of the conversation uh, should be humans. It should be human dignity, it should be human rights, and everyone has a role to play. States have, you know, the obligation already to, you know, to, to make sure that they implement human rights principles. Civil society does advocacy, you know, like Monary said, you know, the technical committee needs to bake it in, uh, and for the private sector, it is very clear, at least between, uh, you know, the COVID problems we had in 2020 and now, it is very clear, I think, for many businesses that, you know, uh, human rights is good for business. When people trust your platform better, uh, they are very likely to use it and become advocates for that. So I really look forward to, you know, uh, the comments and the questions we'll have and the conversations that will continue on this topic of human rights and what is decoderism and making sure that everyone, everyone that needs to be on the table doesn't face barriers to entry. Well, that was well worth waiting for, Benga. I think the points that you make are so crucial to the conversation. I, I, I have to pick up the first point, which is about who's in the room, uh, because this has been a, a persistent issue, not just in this conference, but in many uh, conferences we're at, where we say we want a global perspective, but we're not necessarily able to achieve it. And I do think there's a fundamental question there about what, what are we going to put into that, and what do all of those in the room want to say to all of the governments that they're engaged with about what you need for this forum to be as successful because it's, it's actually a disservice to all of us because uh, that idea of participation, it's not opening the doors as a favor to those who want to participate, as you said. It is a necessity for us to be able to have the experience and knowledge that will allow us to arrive at uh, the right uh, approaches and ideas and insights that we need in a, in a discussion like this. Um, I've gone on too long. It's a point I'm passionate about, um, but, uh, but really appreciated what you had to say as well on the internet shutdown point, one that's a recurrent one from last year's uh, IGF, I'll, I'll point out. Um, but now we are uh, finished with the, the uh, statements from our panelists and really looking forward to seeing if there are questions from the audience that we can uh, bring back to the panel. Um, if you want to come forward to the microphones, uh, please uh, identify yourself, try to keep your comment or, or question short so that we have a chance to, to bring in as many people as possible. Don't all line up at once. I can't see people. Ah, okay, good. We're, we're getting some engagement here in Kyoto. Please. Hi, everyone. Is this, is this, yes, here we go. Uh, my name is Carolyn Tackett. I'm with Access Now, a global organization working to extend and defend the digital rights of people and communities at risk around the world. Thank you so much to the panel for all of your comments and especially on the reflections about the importance of meaningful access to these spaces and making sure that the people whose voices need to be heard the most when we're having these conversations can actually safely engage in these spaces. Um, I don't think any of these reflections on multi-stakeholderism can really arrive at the stated goal if those people aren't able to engage. And so I just want to present the question back to the panel and maybe to you, Benga, first to just kind of build on what you've already shared, but also Eileen and Frederick would be great to hear from you as well. To what extent the, the news that we're hearing about the next location for IGF in Saudi Arabia is in any way compatible with, um, with what you've outlined here? And I think especially understanding where we are in this cycle for, for IGF and coming up at the end of the WISIS Plus 20, um, kind of understanding what the future of the multi-stakeholder model looks like, what a move like this means for our ability to actually bring civil society into these spaces safely and meaningfully. So I'd just like to hear what you all have to say. Thank you. Great, thanks, Caroline. We're gonna take a couple of questions just to make sure we get things in and then come back to the panel. I think there's somebody over here, please. Thank you so much. First, I want to appreciate the conversation on the issue of human rights and human dignity. My name is Mishi Juma Boko. I'm a member of parliament from Kenya, and I represent the Parliamentary Service Commission on the issue of information and public communication. And I just want to say on the human rights perspective, how are you going to address the fear that artificial 
intelligence can create job loss, vis-a-vis -vis is going to create some jobs in terms of uh, research. I'm just looking on a scenario whereby a job which could be done by 10 researchers can just be implemented by just one application. So that is a fear which is across developing countries. Number two is there's the issue of cyberbullying, which is rampant, especially in my country, and mostly is targeting vulnerable uh, group of members of, uh, of the country, like the women, politicians, we have that challenge, and it is very much rampant. I don't know how we're going to address it. My last question is the issue of protection to privacy and personal data. Recently in our country, there were some guys who came from America, and they called themselves WordCoin. Under that banner of WordCoin, they were collecting some personal data from Kenyan citizens. It was a big debate, because even the authority, the Kenyan government, were not aware of what is, was happening in regards to WorldCoin. So it's like there's no international regulations. Anybody maybe can just pop in a certain country and just try to collect some data. So this is a scenario where more fear is being spread to citizens of certain countries. And that is why maybe we really need to have some outreach programs. Or we need to have programs in the entire globe so that at least people would understand what does it entail by artificial intelligence? Because even people think that it can be an international, it can be a threat in terms of internal security. So I think there is a need, not only having these big forums internationally, but we have to disseminate the same information in our countries, far back to our rural areas, whereby up to now, there's still no connectivity. The connectivity is very, very low, and people doesn't understand what is happening. So when you're talking about artificial intelligence, some people think that, who's this monster now coming? Is it the same people like the world coin, or these people are taking our data, or is it going to be a threat in terms of our internal security? So there is a lot Thank to you. talk, and there is a lot to, to discuss and engage people globally. I thank you. Thank you very much for that perspective. Three really important points. Uh, I'm going to take one more question before we go back to the panel, please. Hello, I'm Emma Gibson from the Alliance for Universal Digital Rights, or Audrey for short. And thanks, Eileen, for mentioning the event on day zero minus one that um, we co-organized, which was around the Global Digital Compact and our launch of these um, 10 feminist principles for a global digital compact, which you can ask me for a copy and I'll give you one afterwards. Um, I, it was great to hear some talk about gender, um, human rights, um, is the first of our principles that the GDC should be um, based on the human rights law. Um, but I'd love to hear a little bit more from people around the importance of gender specifically um, in the Global Digital Compact as a cross-cutting theme. Thank you. Thanks very much for those uh, three sets of questions. Uh, we actually ended up with, with five questions. Um, so I'll come back to the panel. Um, maybe Benga said you went last before. You can go first now, please. Thanks for asking that question. Um, so first of all, I don't know how many people were in Addis last year for the IGF. Um, and you know, I said a few things. Um, one of the things I said was it was pretty embarrassing that a country that shut down the internet was hosting the Internet Governance Forum. Um, that may not have been a diplomatic thing to say, but it's the truth. Everyone, including Saudi Arabia, or anyone else who will host the IGF, needs to understand what the IGF means. It means that it is a forum for conversation around the internet, including principles of human rights. Um, I believe that apart from you know, speaking to state obligation and civil society advocacy, uh, we should not be worried about surfacing concerns that we have and asking questions to get guarantees uh, from you know, anyone who has stepped forward to offer to host the IGF. Thank you, Benga. Um, we also had questions relating to gender, to cyberbullying, to the protection of privacy and data, and the uh, impact of AI in the field of work. Who wants to jump in? 
Mallory, you look ready. Yeah, I can, I can jump in with um, answers to two of the questions. The first one, um, specifically on cyberbullying, I just wanted to highlight a really instructive and informative report that um, Center for Democracy and Technology put out about women of color who are politicians in the United States and the um, experiences they have online. That intersection is a real mess for those folks. And what that research really highlights is a bunch of different elements that sort of all stakeholders have a role to play in this. I'm not going to outline all the recommendations, but you can go and look. So the process by which you actually research the problem, understand it from a nuanced perspective, what's actually going on, that is the kind of thing you have to conduct every time there is a problem like this. And it requires the platforms to open up their data to researchers. Um, it requires a um, fine-tooth comb when, it, when, when you're going through um, what the experiences are. In the high level, the recommendations are things like give users more agency. They need the ability to block and report. They need the ability to do that at scale because the attacks against them are often being done at scale. Things like that. So I just I feel like that's a really, really important question. It, it's particularly important for um, those most affected um, for gender um, discrimination. And so I think it's a great example of the kinds of things we need to pay attention to when we're talking about real world harms and human rights. Um, but there are, of course, many, many other. So, um, second question I wanted to respond to was just about um, you know, next year's forum. Just because I alluded to this in the end of my remarks, I think that irrespective of the actual location or the host, human rights has to be a huge part of the conversation. In fact, sometimes I feel like this conference should really just be a human rights and sustainable development conference that we talk about the internet and AI sometimes, right? Like, that would be more useful and beneficial sometimes rather than you know, creating this about the technology. So I want to just say that we've had this happen before. We've had um, internet governance meetings every year happen in places with um, questionable human rights records. It's happened for the IGF in particular in Turkey, 2014, it was just after Gezi Park, right? We had um, Singapore hosted the IETF one year and folks were trying to boycott it because if you were um, LGBTQ, you were not technically legally allowed to go to Singapore then. That was a real problem. Things like that have not deterred the conversations from happening. In fact, I think we have to lean into it and be louder about it. It's an opportunity to talk about these things um, in a different way. Um, and so I'd challenge all of us to make sure that we do that. Thanks, Valerie. Uh, Eileen, you want to come in? It's difficult. They had so many good questions and so many layers to them. Um, I will start with uh, the two points by access. Um, the first one, I have something positive to say. You talked about the necessity of having civil society in the room for these tech policy conversations and internet governance conversations. My um, observation, particularly at this IGF, is that the expertise in the civil society community has skyrocketed, even as compared certainly to governments um, in understanding how the technology works and in relation to, let's say, private sector and technologists in terms of exposure to relevance of the international human rights law framework. So we talk a lot about capacity building to get people in the room. As, you know, Benga, you said that. Um, I think we also need to think about capacity building for the technology community and governments. Um, so that's just a different angle on the same issue. Saudi Arabia, I mean, I would say it is the responsibility of, let's, the IGF community, the leadership panel, the MAG, to, as Mallory said, make sure human rights is squarely on the agenda and emphasized, not hidden, um, and certainly make sure the inclusion piece is um, w that people are paying attention of who's not being allowed in or included. Because it might be different. It might be different. Um, I'm going to also get to the last question about gender and join it with a, our colleague from Kenya. Um, this whole conversation is kind of about the tension between 
the consequences for human rights of exclusion from enjoyment of the technology and the benefits of the technology and the processes around governing the technology and being in the room. But that sits in tension with the risks of inclusion and whether they are inherent risks of the technology that were not thought about before deployed or malign application of the technology by, by authoritarian governments for surveillance, censorship, control of the information realm. And those two things are in tension. I think that event on day minus one really made a giant impression on me how the gender piece is at the heart of that both because women are the most excluded from connectivity itself, but also from all the other dimensions of meaningful inclusion to really be participating and benefit, um, but also at the heart of some of the risks of how the technology is used in ways that are peculiar to women and girls and there's a gender dimension to it. And I think um, that both of those sides of the equation, you know, we have to, this is why we have to elevate the gender conversation. Because if you want to understand the dynamics and the tension between those, both of those sides that we have to do at the same time, we have to solve for the gender piece. Um, on the other point by the uh, Kenyan colleague, labor displacement, in effect, the consequences of AI for labor. That is so under-theorized and so underappreciated, and it's ultimately, I think it's gonna hit us all in every society. You know, that's one way, that societies that are where AI is more embedded are more at risk on the front end of that, the consequences of that. And not, well, I think there's a whole community of people thinking about that, but they tend to be economists. And they otherwise do labor issues. But I don't think uh, many in the technology community are yet focused on that, or even in the human rights community. So I uh, appreciate that question. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, just a, a small comment uh, linking what Mallory said about you know, what we really need is a human rights conference that brings in the internet and your comments about the gender dimension. Um, you know, one of the things I'm often struck by is the extent to which we try to separate or solve problems online when in fact the online world is a reflection of the world that we live in. Um, and that's, that distinction or separation is, is never going to be truly successful. Um, Peter, would you like to come in? Yeah, I would like to pick up this point because I think, you know, we, I, at least I would see, you know, a huge opportunity that we actually can find technology-based solutions to the gender issues which were, which were raised. And I think, you know, it's not rocket science to find ways to identify, you know, gender-based hate speech. Um, it's not rocket science to find a technology-based, um, you know, solution to identify cyberbullying. It's, I think what, what we are lacking is really the will be it from states, be it from the private sector, to really make that a main focus for the next year, rather than you know striving for more efficiency, just to put it very simply. And then regarding um, you know the impact on, on human labor, I couldn't agree more with you on the fact that we really, I think, paying not enough attention to the question what kind of impact um, the use of so-called AI has on, on human labor, which kind of seem to pretend that this is not really happening and that we still have kind of a you know capitalist free market striving for full occupation while a full employment while you know it's actually going in the other direction and we have you know seen now years where we had economic growth with unemployment rates also increasing which is a new phenomenon we also from an economic point of view and uh, I think we just have to, to identify that interdisciplinary debate on where we should strive for, you know, they can, ethics can also contribute in, you know, what, what does it mean for a human to work or not finding, uh, you know, paid professional um, task. And, and of course, you know, other disciplines contributing to, to try and to find a solution for that. Thanks very much. I think there's a, a real agreement on the need for the field of work issue to be looked at more thoroughly. Uh, Frederick, would you like to come in? Well, thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. I just um, I agree with everyone. Everything everyone has um, 
said a hundred times over, it just it struck me particularly in the the comment around cyberbullying uh, and the other comment on um, the centrality of gender or its lack of centrality where it should be central um, is part of this <clears throat> framing and translation problem that I was thinking about in the first comment, which is um, these four are amazing and they're great for talking about the principles, they're great for bringing stakeholders, stakeholders together. You know, I find myself as a human rights lawyer thrust into the center of a, a giant tech company, always needing to uh, make all of that actionable, you know, turn that into things we can do, processes. Um, some, of them are, some of them are technical, some of them are not, some are policy some are messaging appropriately to leadership. But I'm just thinking, for instance, in, in the cyberbullying um, uh, example, uh, human rights is really where we need to start with that question. You, know, you need to start from the principles and from the common and shared global vision that we have for them. But very quickly, you have to get to policy. And we've got a very robust policy on bullying and harassment. In, in Meta, and yet it needs to be constantly iterated and constantly evolve to take account of particular contexts um, for country context, cultural context, language context. And, um, and from there, quickly go to finding um, mitigations and how we, how we land upon them, how we design them, how we implement them very quickly. And just for instance, we've um, We've made adjustments, for instance, to our policies on women public figures and the, the kind of vulnerabilities that they have um, and have made adjustments to bullying and harassment policies that would you know, add protections. The, the issue around user control, you know, enhancing that user control, control and transparency about these things so that people can um, have all the tools that they, that they need to protect themselves. Um, and then, you know, many other complicated issues, language. I mean, on every, every single issue often comes down to language when you're talking about content. Um, and bullying and harassment in particular is a space where we're constantly needing to evolve, um, evolve those policies. And that cannot be done without engagement with communities, without understanding that, um, that we don't have, and that is specific to the, the cultures and communities where, where the platform works. So just, again, uh, thinking forward to the next IGF, another context that just, um, it's that next step from, from the amazing conversations that we've had to finding ways to, to collectively you know, find um, specific solutions in some of these contexts. And obviously AI adds a whole other layer to that. Thanks very much, Frederick. Um, we have time for a, a few more questions, if there are people who would like to come to the mics. Um, I noticed that we didn't thoroughly tackle one of the points raised by our Kenyan parliamentary guest, um, who, who asked as well about sort of the privacy side and the data side, um, and how we, you know, how we see those issues. I, I was in a conversation directly before coming here that really stressed that the, the theme uh, in this uh, IGF is around AI, but that we need to start seeing the AI challenge as a data issue. Um, and that, you know, at, at a minimum, one of the key elements here is, is transparency. Um, and that's the point going back to what Frederick said as well. But uh, a whole nother topic about the way data protection is, is uh, a crucial piece of the AI equation. I see uh, a question over here, please. Sorry, um, I'm a bit short, obviously. Um, I wanted to follow up on a question that was raised because I felt like the response wasn't necessarily um, sufficient. And I think it actually speaks to wider systemic issues. So when we're talking about where we're hosting, whether it's the IGF or other forums in certain contexts, I think the responses, at least from what I heard, <laughs> thank you. Um, the responses, at least from what I heard, was more about um, agenda items that were being raised, so that will include human rights in the agenda, but it feels like the people who have that lived experience who are the most affected are being excluded by design from these spaces, where we have well documented from credible sources the use of technology itself to survey um, marginalized and vulnerable people, so I think that we need to talk about that. And then the other piece about um, people who are excluded because of the visa issues, um, I feel like this is a repeated problem in a lot of um, different forums and contexts, whether it's IGF, we had this happen at RightsCon as well. 
And the conversation then just becomes about how do we guarantee it in this just one context of allowing people to come to a conference but not speak to the wider issues of the bordering of the world that's being enhanced by technology where certain groups of people are allowed to move freely but others are restricted and a lot of that is the vestiges of colonialism and not talking about um, making the uh, key part of our agenda in the IGF um, decolonizing technology as well because it's just reinforcing some of these existing systems that are quite problematic. Um, we see even within like for example the African context that people have been prevented from moving within their own continent Whereas like we have already the mechanisms and systems in place, for example, the EU model of being able to freely travel within their continent, like we know we can do this. It's not that difficult um, in the sense that like the, the models exist, but for, it's only afforded for some populations. And so I think we need to be speaking about the systemic issues and they're often ignored. Um, so I wanted to hear some of that, like what are the actual tangible concrete actions that are being taken to address this instead of repeatedly having these come up as talking points um, in different conferences, including IGF. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question over here, I think. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Arnaldo from Brazil. I'm representing the youth from Brazil. And I would like to uh, quote everything that was said before because I was thinking <laughs> exactly like that. We are from, South from a South perspective, from a youth perspective. And I feel that in the last IGFs we had really um, not sufficient represent representations of our queer, queer community. Like we have just a few people that are transgendered. We, are, we have um, sections of debates that does not represent our perspectives because we are um, daily uh, facing the violence against our communities, not only on the internet, but um, on site as well. And I, need, I see that, see that we have to face these debates and uh, try to propose um, these forums to um, input our perspective to and try to bring more youth perspective and queer perspective to the debates, not only the North ones. And I, I've just wanted to um, implement this uh, Question, not question, but commentary, and try to bring this perspective, this way of thinking. So in the na next ones, we can like build something more queer. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I don't see any other questions, and I told the panelists that we'd come back to them for a, a final comment. So what I think we'll do is we'll respond to the the two final questions or comments here as part of your your final remarks, and I didn't give anybody an order, but I'm thinking about going in reverse order, if that's fair again. Bango, do you mind going first? I don't mind. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's, it's important to reemphasize that the conversation is not about getting human rights uh, on the conversation in Saudi Arabia as a panel. Uh, that will be tokenism, and we're not talking about tokenism. We're talking about the respect of rights and to be seen as respecting rights. And, and I think this is really important because when I spoke about barriers earlier, uh, this is lived experience. This is not theory for people. This is, this is, there are people who've had experiences that are not just dehumanizing, but have also affected spaces they can go to, opportunities they can get, and the things they can do. And so I think it's important to understand that. So this is not just about a panel or about getting certain colors of faces on panels or something. It's about making sure that when we have to have the difficult conversations, we have these difficult conversations, regardless of where this is held. And by the way, this is not just about the next IGF. This is about continuous IGFs. This is about continuous global forums. There are times when we even need to call out countries and platforms that speak the language but do not respect the rights as they should. And I think this is really uh, important. Uh, in, in terms of you know, representation, uh, this is a conversation that, you know, that continues, and I'm glad you know, to uh, know that there are sort of tracks and there are panels and all that, but I think we must realize that as long as we continue to get those questions of oh, you know, young people are not represented, minority groups are not represented, it means that they are not things we should ignore. We should pay attention to them and make sure that 
Uh, things as simple as the guidelines of how to organize workshops, that we literally implement this uh, and, and they become an opportunity. And, and I'm grateful that we've had you know, this conversation today. And I hope that you know, it's not just going to end with this panel. Uh, I hope that the conversations will continue in the hallways uh, and even beyond here about what must we do. The state has an obligation, private sector, human rights is good for your business. It's no longer trying to emotionally blackmail you. Um, you know, for technical community, you have to build it in. And civil society, we must not shy away from speaking truth to anyone, including even our allies. I'm kind of wishing I'd left you for last because that was a great closing statement. Thank you very much, Benka. Uh, over to you, Frederick. Oh, thank you. Um, look, this is my very first IGF, and it's my very first time representing Meta at such a forum. So I'll um, forego my, you know, my critique. But I would just say that um, uh, I've been very excited to be here. I've been very, very happy, and the company has been very, very happy at the framing. Um, the centrality of human rights to almost all the conversations that we've been in. It was um, very hard to figure out where I should be because almost every single conversation, every single panel that we've been engaged on has touched upon human rights, usually explicitly, but if not um, implicitly. So I do think it's worth thinking about doubling down on that approach as a few people have, have um, suggested. And uh, from our side, I think we'd be very pleased with that kind of uh, that kind of framing. At the same time, look, I've been in a lot of conferences in my life on the civil society time side and in many other capacities. Yeah, a lot more can be done to make this uh, a more inclusive process. A lot more can be done to ensure that the framing of the issues and the issues that we deal with are getting to the heart of the problem, particularly more systemic problems, and. Um, so I think, there's, I think there's work to be done there as well, but, but very excited to be part of this. And just wanted to end by saying that um, we get a lot of criticism, and rightly so in many cases, and uh, very happy to spend time um, talking about the issues that are specific to us. But part of why Meta brought so many people here and decided to have such a high-level delegation to the IGF is to message to everybody across all of the stakeholder groups that were committed to this conversation and um, are ready to move forward and support it in every way we can in the future. Thanks. Thanks very much, Frederick. Um, we wanted to turn to Morelsa if you're uh, online and had a uh, concluding comment. Thank you very much, Peggy. Um, I just wanted to make two comments uh, regarding previous questions. Um, you know, in terms of the, uh, the issue of online violence that has really become a new front line for journalists, for educators, for cultural workers, for scientists, and particularly for women in these professions. It, this is an escalating freedom of expression and access, access to information crisis. You know, because this is really driving away the professionals that actually bring truth and facts to the, to the digital ecosystems. And this kind of harassment uh, and abuse is a combination of, uh, you know, not only threats and, uh, and uh, misogynistic comments, but digital privacy and security breaches that expose identifying information, exacerbate, uh, you know, the offline safety threats for them. You know, 73% of women journalists are actually harassed online, and a high proportion of those actually suffer attacks offline. So this is a, a thing that we really need to bring, you know, to discuss. Um, I wanted also to comment on the labor questions uh, uh, that was asked before. And uh, we, we know that jobs will certainly change uh, you know, so through artificial intelligence, and we really don't know yet what the end effects will be in terms of employment numbers. But what we see and what really worries me more is that how technology is stripping away some of the labor protections that took decades to construct. Gig worker is, is really precarious worker. And there's not really enable people to realize their right to earn a decent living. It may also impact consumers negatively. You know, I saw uh, the other day an article about nurses being hired like Ubers. And this is, has terrible consequences for the health of their own patients and for the nurses themselves, for their own mental health. And we need to bring these issues, uh, you know, to, the, to our conversations uh, um, and so for that, I would like to close by offering an IG, the IGF uh, one suggestion. 
You know, the IGF is a great place for bringing together multiple stakeholders, but we're still missing some that are critical to our dialogue on human rights and technology. So I'd like to remind us that uh, regulatory authorities that create the norms under which digital technologies operate should be brought in, like information commissioners, data protection authorities, human rights commissioners. They should be a regular feature and participants uh, in uh, um, um, the, uh, the IGF uh, uh, um, meetings. Media also, you know, is, is, is not really present enough. And uh, they are the ones who create awareness among the general public about the digital issues and bring their own experiences of opportunity and harm uh, that digital technologies uh, realize. Um, and policymakers that lead digital transformation that can help us create this pipeline of knowledge to policy uh, on human rights-based approach to digital development and finally, judges and public prosecutors that are, who are the ones who bring human rights violations to justice um, that really need to be part of our conversation. So I'll close here and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Morales. I, I think it's uh, that call for that even broader sense of inclusion is, is really wonderful. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, I'm going in reverse order, so I'm going to go next to Mallory, please. Um, my concluding remarks will also comment on a couple of the questions we didn't get to. Um, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about privacy because it didn't come up, and I think it is an interesting omission on this panel. I think it's because, and it's, it's hard to overstate this, I keep saying it, but we have a really complex landscape. And I think privacy is a good example of that. We've been doing nothing but talking about privacy for the last 10 years or more, right? It's 2023, 2013 was the Snowden revelations. We were talking about it before that. The Snowden revelations were very helpful to our argument. It really highlighted and demonstrated what, what was wrong. And we did a great deal, especially at the technical level, to fix that with rolling out um, transport encryption everywhere and ensuring people's connections um, and also that now their DNS lookups are, are behind encryption, but we've never had a bigger privacy crisis. And it's worth introspecting on that, right? Is it the business model? Is it that you can still be targeted by um, someone who not only wants to survey you, or not someone, but a regime that wants to survey you and also do you harm? I mean, we have to do both. We have to look at the big picture re-architect the way the internet works, and we also have to zoom into the details and pay attention to how end users are being affected. And that's just one issue. And everyone is bringing in this incredibly important element of representation and of participation. And, and so we need more, not less. We have more issues to talk about, more dimensions to those issues to talk about in more places. And so I think one of the last things I wanted to just conclude on is uh, something that was just very briefly mentioned, but we haven't uh, really confronted in this panel yet, which is maybe the creation of new mechanisms within the UN to talk about internet and AI and other things with the global digital compact and so on. I feel like we're never actually replacing anything. We're only adding to the space. That is not necessarily a, um, a negative thing in and of itself, but something that we have to reflect upon. We are in increasing the complexity of what it is we're trying to govern and what it is we're talking about um, when we're governing it and, and then the processes and then how we actually do it. Um, and so I would caution us to uh, really think about the opportunity there, but also the risk. The opportunity is what the colleague over here from Brazil said. We can bring in new and better and more interesting and fun issues from the next generation, real things that are happening in places that we haven't had enough representation of yet, and, and deal with those and expand what we're able to um, what we're able to address. But I would just be careful that we do not take all kinds of social issues and put them into the technical bucket, that we don't technocracize um, everything. I think that's one of the risks I see in expanding this community rather than thinking about how, how we take our technical expertise and our technical conversations out into the world where um, the real end issue is sort of being discussed and being put forward. I think that's another model where, yes, it still contributes to the complexity, but it's coming at the issues from a different angle. Thanks. Very interesting and thoughtful comment there, uh, Mallory. Let's go over to Peter, please. Well, thank you so much. And I wish first to thank, um, you know, the colleagues who asked these questions. 
and actually want to you know dedicate my my final statement to basically reiterate what they were saying um, what at least I understood and I hope I paraphrased that correctly basically saying listen we cannot deal with the visa issue if you're not talking about migration in a more systemic way and I think that's something maybe we can even be more self-critical to us you know to, to, to continuously ask us if you don't have like if you have a concrete question we need to look at it also from a systemic point of view we look, need to look at institutions um, we need to look at structures um, being maybe structures of injustice and we have to address them and the same goes with the strong statement on representation I think it's a it's at least I hear a strong call to every one of us um, to keep continuously being self-critical in 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 about you know do we really live what we are talking about are there any things we are willingly or unwillingly um, not respecting in our practice um, but also are there maybe also some some blind spot we need to, we we need to address because I think you know that the, the field and that's my last sentence um, I think the field of let's say legal discussion about um, artificial, so-called artificial intelligence, but also the ethical discourse about it, at least has the tendency to run the risk um, to be very good in preaching, but not so good in action so far. Um, so I think we can get a huge step forward if we start really taking action on what we are, um, you know, have been riding on in recommendations, guidelines, uh, etc. Thank you so much. Very good point. I see. I see Bengal uh, smiling. I, I expect many in the room are as well. Uh, the practical side of what this all means on the ground is is crucial. Um, I'd like to turn first to, to Cameron online, and we saw you pop in for a moment, Cameron. I hope you're still there to give us some thoughts from your perspective, and we'll close with Eileen. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so first, I wanted to just briefly address a couple of the questions that were asked earlier. Um, one of them was about, you know, about gender, and, the other, and another one was also about queer representation. And I think this gets to, a, you know, to build on what Frederick said earlier, you know, this gets to a point about how are we structuring at the big platforms, you know, and the tech companies, what we consider human rights teams. Although oftentimes they focus on sort of, uh, you know, state-based violations, you know, sort of the traditional human rights narratives. Um, but where, for example, does gender equity sit in an organization when it's, when it's global? And I think we need to start to think about repurposing human rights teams. What are we considered human rights? How are we defining human rights outside of perhaps just privacy and uh, surveillance and freedom of expression? As I often would tell my students, there's more to being a human being online than what I say and who's listening. So I think it's important for us to start to actually, you know, from the platform perspective, make some actionable steps towards understanding what human rights teams do and how they move forward. With regard to the question about AI and uh, uh, labor displacement, I think there's a really important, you know, component with labor that involves access to, you know, factual and accurate information. And I'm a skeptic of a lot of AI. My academic work has criticized it from a human rights perspective. Um, but I do think, for example, with Wikipedia, it is a very vital resource for a lot of people. Um, they're able to get information they might not have otherwise gotten. And AI can actually be, you know, even though I'm skeptical, in general, here I think it's very good, wonderful app, potential application of it because it can be used, for example, to translate articles to, to translate articles across languages. It can be massive gaps between different language wikis, over 300 languages on the platform, um, and also it can help people who, for example, are whatever language they're writing and isn't their first language. So there's opportunities also for uh, individual communities and language groups around the world to build out the knowledge that's available for people that might help offset, unfortunately, some of the disruptions that will happen, be happening. And this is not from a sort of a late stage capitalist uh, perspective. Uh, but um, also to my you know, final question, uh, put briefly, some members from the Wikimedia team are in the audience. If you'd like to speak with them, they are there to happy to chat with you about human rights, AI, or anything else. Um, and I started discussing dignity, and I think I will go ahead and close with that. You know, governments around the world, they, they have a, like a basic charge uh, to protect their citizens. And to me, that means that you know, even the most you know, repressive regime uh, you know, has some basic conception that you know, people have a worth and that that worth merits protection. So we have a baseline there. And I think going forward, it's really important that we, you know, that laws and regulations, you know, and social norms around technology, around the internet, around artificial intelligence, 
you know, continue to build upon that idea that we all have something worthwhile and worth sharing, worth contributing to. And I would say, especially when we disagree with each other, given everything that's happening, especially when we're, when facts are inconvenient. So I really do hope that we move forward with, you know, working on that baseline and remember that, you know, we are here to protect human beings online and offline. And that includes, you know, you know, digital activists in prison around the world and all of those who are, you know, really advocating for free and open knowledge. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cameron. And we're running out of time, so quickly over to Eileen for Brother, the final word. Um, wow, last, that last question over here, I just, I, Benga, you, you said everything that needs to be said, I think, about inclusion and process and risks of the, for people in the real world. The question that comes up for me is, I, I am not really aware of how the decision was made. I mean, choices have been made in the past, Mallory, you know, Turkey, Ethiopia, Azerbaijan. So, so I don't know how that those decisions are made, but perhaps as we think about the next phase of the IGF, that those decisions are made elsewhere, at different people at the table. That's one idea. Um, I'm just going back to a couple of things I heard from colleagues. Um, Peter, uh, um, the, actually the person online, the last gal from UNESCO, right? She talked about the need for regulatory authority in terms of the, all the online content related harms. Peter, at the very beginning, you said, well, we can't forget the other side of the equation. Tech regulation itself has to be consistent with human rights. And that, too, is a very significant problem around the world. Um, uh, you also talked about not just the uh, impact of technology for generating uh, you know, uh, facilitating violence against women or violations of human rights, but you hit the other side, which is technology should be applied to be the solution as well. And there's always going to be this game of cat and mouse, but that has to be done more. And then last is uh, Frederick and Mallory, you guys both emphasize this, this need for translation between the tech community and the norms community um, and I think that is a really exciting area and um, I think there's a lot of potential and a lot of growth in that space we've been talking about it for a few years at a very abstract level but I think people are starting to figure out what does it look like in practice if you are you're talking about human rights and AI how do we do those assessments what last one DPI was another, digital public infrastructure was brought up outside this room a lot. And I see that as an area where you hit the inclusion problem, inclusion in the technology, tech for the SDGs, but you also connect it with human rights by design. And so you're, you're basically bringing economic, social, cultural rights and civil political rights together. So that's another area to be mined. Great, thanks, Noah. A lot of uh, content there. We're at the end of our time. I think it's been a, a really rich conversation. Um, I hope it leaves uh, all of you, as it does me, with, with not just some, some insights, but also some work to do in terms of what we can all do to, to pick up on the, the themes that have been brought out in this session and how we can both improve the, the rest of this forum and how we can build towards uh, bringing these human rights issues and the human rights framework into the conversations that we want to have here and in other forums and in the next IGF as well. Thank you all so much for your participation. I realized there were some questions online that we couldn't get to. I apologize for that um, and really look forward to having further conversations on this topic throughout the rest of the IGF. Thank you. <laughs>